Major funding for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, now with second quarter corporate earnings streaming, the general consensus about economic activity is not so bad. But then again, it's not so great either. I'm Chris William, and welcome back to the most broadly watched dialogue on public policy and business in the Carolinas. For at least the last three years, the sense of uncertainty and economic malaise has dominated. Are we trying to operate now in this new reality over the last couple of years using a pre-2008 set of rules? What's working, and how do organizations that excel do it? We blend the issues of the day with a forward-looking dialogue, as always, on this program. And joining us later, RTP-based successful startup CEO Neil Fowler of Liquidia. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by... Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded July 13, 2012. On this week's program, Bill Mahoney of the South Carolina Research Authority, David Hollers of the Central Carolina Workforce Development Board, and special guest, Neil Fowler, Chief Executive Officer of Liquidia. Hello, welcome again to our program. Bill, welcome back. Good to have you here. And David, Thank glad to have much. you on the program. Glad to be here. Uh, B Bill, let's start with you. Uh, not so too long ago on this program, a gal named uh, Victoria Haynes, uh, who was the, who then, not, not long ago, was the chief executive at Research Triangle Institute, RTI. Do a lot of government contracts. There's a lot of, as I said on the air with her, a lot of black box work going on over there, and I wasn't quite sure. But uh, one of the things that Victoria said, <coughs> let me get to the point, one of the things that Victoria said that she was concerned going forward, they were, uh, were, were focusing on replacing a lot of the federal contracts for whatever services that RTI does. You have a little bit to do with federal contracts. A little bit, yeah. Hot, how do you see this, the current status of uh, the austerity as we talk about it in federal contracts and, and, and spending and budget? And, and how is that going to affect uh, SCRA, South Carolina Research Authority? Well, uh, so we derive about 70% of our revenue from the federal government, primarily mission-oriented agencies, defense, homeland security, uh, energy, and justice. Um, what's happened in the government contracting uh, area is that the process is generally broken. It's very difficult to execute uh, individual contracts. Uh, there's been an effort by the federal government to insource a lot of that activity, but um, despite the fact that I think they've added about 13,000 procurement workers over the last several years, most of those folks are inexperienced. So it's actually had a beneficial effect on us because in addition to taking prototypes and discoveries out of labs and bench, off of benches and getting them operational and in the market, uh, we have these large-scale either center or omnibus contracts, and we find that we, it's, it's a lot easier for the government to source uh, through subcontractors through our contracts rather than create new contracts with these companies. So it's actually been a boon to our business. Uh, now, you, you, you said the word workers, and David, that, that leads itself to jobs here. Let, let's talk about jobs and workforce development. Let's kind of take a, a not a big stretch here. Um, jobs. Governor Purdue in North Carolina has been in the Charlotte region a lot over the last two years, talking about, uh, you know, new company coming, Chiquita's company, this company's coming, Siemens, the energy industry has at, been adding a lot, and just a, a lot of new jobs announcements. How many of those jobs are actually showing up now? And, 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 and here's the second part of the question. 
the stimulus dollars that were out there to replace or to add jobs, how, many, how, many of the, how much of that money has moved through the system, too? Where are we? Well, first of all, the announcements that come out about job opportunities are terrific. We love seeing those. But you have to look at the details in that. And sometimes it's five or six, seven years of actually hiring individuals. Siemens is a great example. They're looking at hiring 850 people, but it's over a five-year period. They are doing it in really in chunks of 50 to 70 people at a time. And we've been working with the Central Line Board and the Charlotte Works Board to help put together a website so we can help them find the right type of talent for their individual company. Same with any of the new companies coming in, whether it's Chiquita or whatever. Those are taking a while to get through the pipeline. People are interested in the jobs, but those companies are looking for the right <coughs> kind of talent that people have to have the certifications, the skills, the education, and the mm -hmm. work experience to make that happen. The stimulus dollars were important to us when we got in our region. Uh, we did a lot of those for and retraining. And this is specifically the Charlotte region? Specifically the Charlotte region. Uh, a lot of that was through retraining through the community college system. We also used some through hire young people to do work experience. And a lot of young people got the experience they need to move into jobs. The real tragedy is that uh, we still have high unemployment, even without mm -hmm. with the stimulus. Uh, it helped temporarily but we still have the other issues that happen within our economy that drove unemployment up, made hiring really uh, not a priority for a lot of companies, and we're still going to, I think, be in that kind of lull through the end of this calendar year mm -hmm. until after the elections. Yeah, you know, Bill, let's come back to this for a second, because you just alluded that some of these federal contracts that hire folks and they're not qualified, we have heard that in this dialogue before, that many people complain that... <laughs> We got, we got a mid-8s unemployment number. Right. You know, it goes anywhere, 8, 4, 8, right. 5, 8, 6, wherever it is. Um, but yet, uh, um, employers say they, they cannot find qualified workers. Is that kind of crazy? Do you buy that? Uh, you know, I think there's a, a massive, uh, and of course David would know more about this than I do, there's a massive retraining requirement in the country. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, in, when I first came into the workforce, and I <clears throat> probably shouldn't confess how long ago that was, but uh, corporations did a lot of training, uh, both in their, in their sales and marketing facing resources and their technical people. Corporations can't afford to do that anymore. So what you very often the, uh, a company is looking for is somebody who's been trained by some other company mm -hmm. to do the job. Um, so uh, because they're unwilling to invest, they claim that there's a shortage of workers. I don't think there's a shortage of, of workers. The workers just need to be able to align their skill sets and the training opportunities they have with the new requirements out there in the, in the marketplace. So is this, is this uh, David, <coughs> is this more of an apprentice-master type of relationship? Could be. That's one option there. A lot of people have looked at that. Are we doing that? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Right. Are we doing that enough? That seems like that would be something that could really save us here. It could be. The, the key thing there, Chris, is that it takes a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort to make it happen. If you go upon the strict German model that a lot of companies, whether it's Siemens or Detweiler or Julius Bloom up in Lincoln County have done, they've taken that process. They have staff dedicated to it. They work through the high schools and even the middle schools and through the community colleges to get the people to work for those companies. It's a great if it works, but it takes a lot of time, a lot of investment, and many companies are not willing to do that. Whether it's small, medium-sized company, they don't have the time or the staff to do it. I think you're right on target, Bill. You've got to match up the talent, the skills with the jobs that are available out there. And mm -hmm. what we're finding is that a lot of individuals don't know how to assess their own talent. Mm -hmm. yeah. They say, I've always worked in X industry. How do I take that and make it work in Y industry? If I've been in advanced manufacturing, how do I move into the healthcare field? How do I learn about what's needed there, get the additional training on my own or through programs like we do through workforce boards to make that happen? And, and, and we, you know, it's not fair, David, we didn't give you enough time, but we're trying to shoehorn about five pounds of stuff in a, in a two-pound bag. Uh, Bill, back to you just, just quickly here. Fracking. In North Carolina, uh, the General Assembly has legalized fracking. That's mm -hmm. the best way to say it. They haven't allowed drilling. They've legalized fracking. Where they go from here. Uh, just give us a, a, just a, a really brief, what is fracking? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it a risk to a community? Is it going to be good for the Carolinas? Well, I think it will be good because I think all the statistics are saying is it's job growth and it's, I, I read an article the other day that... But can, be, can it be done safely? Yes, it can. I mean, uh, first of all, you're drilling at such depths that you're well below the water table. And so the biggest challenge is taking the extract from the well, which is a mixture of water and chemicals, 
extracting that cleanly, uh, transporting it cleanly, and then reprocessing and recycling it into the water table. That's the big challenge. It's not the impact of the drilling mm -hmm. itself. Okay, and here's one. You're going to love this, David. Less than 60 seconds, I'm going to ask you. Uh, let's talk about Duke and Progress for just a second. Right. I'm not talking about the drama about <laughs> what's going on, uh, but Duke and Progress and workforce development. What kind of impact is this merger? Uh, and it seems like the Utility Commission in North Carolina is going to, uh, going to continue with their decision to allow it. Um, is this a good thing? Is it going to fracture what you're trying to do in your region? What, what, what goes on there? I think it's a good thing. It makes Duke the number one player for energy in the entire country. And you mean the combined Duke the progress? The combined Duke progress. I think it brings uh, a lot of impetus and a lot of attention to the Charlotte region and North Carolina as being an energy hub. We're already trying to make the Charlotte USA region that. We've got great companies here. I think Duke and the subsidiaries will be a very important part of what we do for workforce development for years to come. I see it only as a positive for us. Once we get beyond the drama and everything mm -hmm. with the Utilities Commission, I think the combined company is going to bring strength for the energy industry, keep rates low, and keep jobs here. There will be, of course, some as you merge in any type two companies, you're looking at ways to uh, streamline your processes, reduce duplication. Every company is now looking for efficiencies mm -hmm. in how they do business. Duke will be no different from that, but I think it's a positive for this region and for workers. How long do you think the Utility Commission in North Carolina is going to hold their feet to the fire? Uh, I think it may be a while. I think that uh, I think they were not pleased with how the whole decision about Rogers and Johnson and how that turned out, but I think that uh, overall they will eventually give it their blessing, and uh, after a little bit of probation period, they may be able to move on. The question is how long the probation period? <laughs> you never let can you off tell. The <laughs> Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, stay with us. We're going to meet our guest in just a moment. Next week on this program, during, you know, during the last few years, we've heard a lot more about private equity. The question is, what is private equity? How does it differ from funding models and capital investment that we've had traditionally? Uh, we've got a panel that will talk about private equity as it stands now in the Carolinas. What are they doing? What's Successful, and how do they get done what they get done without uh, without a lot of public scrutiny? And then in two weeks, uh, the Affordable Health Care um, uh, Act was endorsed. If I guess it, uh, we can certainly say the decision came down from the Supreme Court of the United States that it was in fact constitutional, and it looks like we're we're, we're moving on with that. Uh, we have another panel to talk about where we head now with affordable care. Sure, our guest leads a company that has a very cool business model of being in bio nanotech something. <laughs> sure, they were spun off from UNC Chapel Hill. Sure, they had a very successful capital raise from none other than the Gates Foundation and Bill Gates himself. The question is how? Joining us now, Liquidia Chief Executive Officer Neil Fowler. Okay, Neil, how? How have you done all of that? You know, when everyone's singing the blues, that, you know, we're not sure about regulation, it's uncertain about the economy, we're having a tough time getting financing, here you are raising money, here you are signing deals with uh, GlaxoSmithKline, among others. H how are you doing that? Well, it's, uh, I could go on for an hour on this, but the concise answer, um, really, it's the perfect intersection, Chris, of a lot of things coming together. I mean, it all started... Uh, which I think never gets enough credit in academia. Um, Professor Joe Simone is a prolific uh, inventor and founder of ours. He's on faculty at UNC. He came up with a change the world technology that really needed to be financed. And we were able to, as you mentioned, uh, find some really great financing early on. We, we are backed by a tremendous group of investors. Um, we've taken advantage of, um, in some cases, federal funds on the grant uh, mm -hmm. front to really begin to scale out our manufacturing, which has been a real um, limitation um, of a lot of startup nanotechnology companies in the past. And it, and it also, uh, I have to say, is about a, a great employee base. Um, I know the conversation that you were having earlier has to do with training of employees. Mm -hmm. We have a, a very new to the world technology that quite honestly can't be pulled off the shelf. And we've had to train and teach our people um, as we've gone, but we've learned together. And now we're beginning to pull out of what is that, that traditional startup mode into more of a development phase, which we're able to tap into a great infrastructure here in the Carolinas of a workforce that, that's done mm -hmm. this um, with regard to pharmaceutical and biotech. You know, Neil, 2008 really changed the rules for a lot of us. You know, when, when, when the financial markets cratered, when uh, folks uh, uh, got even more negative on big business, I mean, it really, it really on, a, on a secular level, changed a lot. Um, do we need to think differently about how we incentivize risk now? Do we need to think differently about how we take risk? Are we not doing that right? 
Well, I, I don't know that that things so much have changed. I, I think the economic environment to a large degree influences people's um, openness to taking risk for sure. I think, you know, one of maybe uh, being ignorant is good, as I like to say sometimes. So in, in our industry, it really has its genesis in a lot of ways in the pharmaceutical and biotech arena. And when you look at those arenas, we play in a high risk category to begin with. So we look at the external environment and say, to some degree, it's another day. <laughs> Um, because there are a lot of failures, and, and we learn from those failures. I mean, if it wasn't for, you know, the cures of cancer and things like that being related to a lot of failures, we wouldn't be where we are in healthcare today. Um, that said, I do think that there is a tendency in an environment like this for the macro forces to kind of slow down. We're, we're certainly seeing this venture capital um, has, mm -hmm. has been much more restricted. Uh, federal grant money is becoming much more restricted. NIH is going through its own challenges, and I think there's been a real hesitation at times to kind of put your head in the sand. And, you know, like I always say, the, the, the fruit is out on the end of a limb for a reason. That means you've got to climb out on the limb. And so we've got to really, I, I think it's times like this actually where we kind of need to step up. We talk about that with our employee base a lot. And I think this is when you do take risk. And I think the environment is there for us to still take advantage mm -hmm. of that. We've been able to do that. Um, it's, it's certainly not the type of environment and market for me too technologies. I think, you know, the, the payer system being what it is today, there's a big reluctance to reimburse technologies that, that uh, quite honestly, the world's already seen. But when it comes to breakthrough technologies, I think we do need a longer view um, to take things to a whole nother level. And as we look at over the next 20 to 30 years, we certainly see mm -hmm. nanotech as being one of those uh, industries that can transform the landscape. Bill. Yeah. You know, Neil, first of all, congratulations on your progress oh, well, so thank far. You. Um, and, and in reading about your, uh, Liquidia Technology, I was, I, was, I was struck by the question, are you a nanotechnology initially applying in biopharma, or are you a biopharma company using nanotechnology? And if the answer to all that is yes, how do you handle the interdisciplinary challenges of your organization? Right, it, it's a great question, and to be completely honest, that's the number one thing we grapple with at Liquidia on a daily basis. Um, it, it starts broadly, the first part of your question, um, we are nanotech, but there's a subset of nanotech that has to do very specifically with biotech. Um, nanotechnology has been around for, for many decades. In fact, it, surprisingly, a lot of people don't know this, but it's a, almost a $2 trillion industry. Mm -hmm. Um, the new part of that, though, has to do with the life science side, the, the nanomedicine side. And interestingly, even that is already almost the size of the biotech industry as we know it um, in the U.S. today. Mm -hmm. um, we, we play in biotech, but our platform technology, believe it or not, can be used for an immense array of uses outside of life science. And so our constant challenge is to take a platform technology that literally could be used in every walk of life a startup can't do all of these things. There are cap structure issues, and there's no way you could do all of that. But we have to be very smart about focus. We have to be very smart about walking before you can run. And once we begin to learn the technology, our plan is to begin to grow that out into more and more uses, and eventually beginning to even uh, tackle the non-life science can you do? Can you do that when you've got this, this, this angel and demon on each shoulder? You've got this burn <laughs> rate going on? I mean, how much time can you take to really separate off those two disciplines? Well, the, the financing is no doubt that probably the, the biggest single thing we deal a lot with. We have a, a great board of directors. We spend a lot of time talking about alternative structures. Um, you know, I'm, I'm quick to, to speak with them all the time about we have a new to the world technology, but it's also in a lot of ways a new to the world uh, business case mm -hmm. because it's a very unique one where you're trying to tackle the world's problems in a startup mode as you mentioned and I think what's going to be critical to our success as we go forward is to be uh, outside of the box in terms of our thinking. It could be that in some cases we spin out new companies. It could be in some cases that we aggressively out license parts of our technology in certain areas. Um, but it's going to, it's not your, your typical, uh, I call it one trick pony biotech company where everything's riding on one product. The interesting thing here is we're talking about multiple products in multiple therapeutic areas that impact a lot of lives. And so in a restricted financing environment, we're going to have to be very creative about the way we pace and, and look at ways to, to get the, uh, technology expanded. David? You talked earlier about your training you provide for your employees. Uh, and being a new industry, relatively new for nanotechnology, right. just like biotechnology for a lot of people, they're interested in how to be part of it. 
What do you look for as far as talent requirements for individuals who say, I want to work for Liquidia, I want to work in the nano nanotechnology industry? Right. You know, we, we are blessed to have a very, if you went and walked into Liquidia today, we have about 54 employees. Um, we're happy to say we're getting ready to add some. Um, what's neat about that is it's a, a neat intersection of polymer scientists, biologists, uh, even we're beginning to kind of sprinkle in now for the first time a, a, a bigger set of business development type of people. Um, thanks to our growth, but it's an intersection of these sciences that really heretofore have not had to come together and talk. And, and what we found is we, we benefit by the diversity, believe it or not, of the science and technical training. Um, it's a new um, field that we're walking into, and so we have people from several different disciplines. And what I'm really looking for are people that can think out of the box, um, people that are great leaders um, and are willing to kind of take the hill and, and, and not be the question that, that Chris asked earlier, not put their head in the sand and, you know, do that. We've got a new technology we've got to get out there. And so we like the science backgrounds, but we also like the, the leadership uh, capabilities and the risk-taking. Uh, I was going to say risk-taking is probably a very at, important at, part of what you're Absolutely, and we encourage that quite openly at Liquidia. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, Neil, um, just to give you a quick, uh, SCRA, we have our SC launch program. We invest in startups like yours. We had a... Uh, company that spun out of the Medical University of South Carolina, uh, Immunologics, monoclonal antibody company, right. were just acquired by Intrexon, which is mm -hmm. a synthetic biology company. Right. And uh, in our innovation center in Charleston, mm -hmm. what was actually being done more or less by hand is now being replicated by robots. I, I share that with you to ask you the question as background. When Liquidia Technologies ramps, how are you going to do that? And is it going to be a combination of great people and automation? Or wh how do you foresee, if you go up the Gla GlaxoSmithKline ramp, what will right. it look like for your company? Yeah, I, well, the first thing I would say is we'll, we'll take, we take a blank sheet of paper to any of these approaches. And I, w I would say anything's fair game for us. Um, to date, one of the things we've done in a very big way, especially on our manufacturing, because scaling is, as I mentioned earlier, a really big issue for us. We've done that on the back of partners. So we've been very aggressive um, signing. We just, as you may be aware, signed a recent agreement with uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Mm -hmm. um, we also have an active agreement with Procter & Gamble. And both of those partners um, are tremendous for us, not only in terms of the science they bring and the commercial markets, but also manufacturing. Right. So we, um, for example, Procter & Gamble is a, a wonderful uh, company at Roll to Roll Technology, which is the backbone of what we do. So okay. although we haven't had to scale like that at this point, and to your point about there will be a ramp up out there, they are best in the world at that, and that's where the partnership and, and um, combined expertise come into play. Um, that said, I, you know, it's a global marketplace, too, and, and we're continuing to find and uh, hear from other corners of the world um, about different ways to go about things. And I think you know, we're a very collaborative organization, and we'll continue to be so, and I think anything's on the table. Good. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Let me ask you, too, we were talking before we came in the session here, about your background with Johnson and Lilly as larger corporations, and now you're an entrepreneur startup. Right. We're trying to help a lot of individuals who are in midlife trying to transition, as well as trying to get young people interested in the idea of being entrepreneurs. How do you, do you come to be that person, that entrepreneur in midlife, and working through the idea of a startup company? How, and how do we instill that kind of culture with the individuals, whether they become a business owner or not? How do we instill that idea of thinking outside the box and being risk takers, the talent you're looking for. How do we get that with people who are in transition as well as young people? Yeah, it's a great question. Obviously, if we had the simple answer, we would all be doing it so well. <laughs> right. I, you know, we, Joe DeSimone, I mentioned, who is our founder, he spends a lot of uh, time on this at UNC, and he and I and a couple of our investors work closely with folks even at UNC on this topic. I, I think it starts first and foremost with exposure. Um, I think a lot of times on the young people side and even middle-aged people, I think it's a little bit of you don't know what you don't know. And I think a lot of us have this um, ability to want to go and run companies, but we're either risk-averse, we don't know the right people, and, it's, and we tend to put handcuffs on ourselves. Right. We have, even at Liquidia, tried to mentor a lot of high school, college kids. We're very active um, and, um, hiring. And, uh, and I hate to do this to you. We're, we're running out of time because it's, it's just getting interesting on how huh. you get to that point. And it, it's worth saying, Neil, that, and I know you, you would have said this had I given you the chance, that Joe DeSimone is 
uh, I would say beloved in your field and certainly in the triangle. I wish, uh, you know, we'll have him on uh, next time we have you on. Thank you for being on the program. Thank you for having me, Chris. Congratulations. You know, you're coming back, I hope. No, no really, absolutely. We, got, we have anytime, more to talk about. Anytime. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Uh, David, good to see you. Good to see you again, Chris. Good luck in the, in the Central Eye region and Charlotte and all that. Major and, funding uh, for Carolina Business Review was provided by... The Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton an international accounting tax and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.